Welcome, everyone. On a nice, cool, windy evening in Los Angeles. Thank you all for being here. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with you for uh, another in our director series, and we're very lucky to have with us tonight Renzo Piano. I'd like to thank some of my trustees for being here and the audience and some of the members of our director circle and president circle, our highest levels of membership, who help uh, create events like this for us and support them. Um, and then I'd also like to uh, invite uh, Paul Dana, who's here, right? From AIA. Yeah, there you are. Oh, in the dark. <laughs> president of AIA Los Angeles to say a few words. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Uh, on behalf of the Los Angeles chapter of the American Institute of Architects, I would just like to say how pleased we are to be co-sponsors of this uh, series, the Master of Architecture series. Uh, it's, a, it's been a wonderful event for us over the years. Uh, I would like to thank LACMA for continuing to open their doors to us, to architects and those interested in the built environment. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, Francesca Garcia Marquez, uh, one of our members, uh, for helping co-produce uh, co this event. I just found out uh, a, a bit ago that Francesca has been helping uh, organize and co-produce this event for over 19 years now, so quite a commitment. And the other fun fact, her very first invitee to speak here uh, was indeed our guest tonight. Uh, so the, uh, the last thanks goes to uh, our very esteemed guest uh, for being here to graciously spend his time, share his thoughts with us. And so with that, I'll turn the floor back over to Michael to introduce our uh, respected speaker. Thank you, Michael. Thanks, Paul. We love partnering with the AIA Los Angeles in this series. Um, so yet another person who needs very little introduction, especially to this crowd. Uh, Renzo Piano was born in Genoa, Italy in 1937. I'm proud to say someone is here from Genoa just to see him, another Genovese. Um, so it's a two in one room at LACMA at the same time. Uh, he graduated in 1964 from the School of Architecture of the Milan Polytechnic. And um, as a student, he was working under the design guidance of Fra Franco Albini, while also regularly attending his father's building sites. And he got a lot of practical experience that you do feel in his buildings from the builder's perspective. Um, he, uh, in 1971, he founded Piano and Rogers Agency with Richard Rogers, as most of you know, his partner on the Centre Pompidou project in Paris. And in 1977, he founded L'Atelier Piano and Rice with engineer Peter Rice, who was very important to his work and, and worked on many projects until his death in 1992, um, which led him to found Renzo Piano Building Workshop with offices in Paris and Genoa. Some 100 people work with him, uh, architects, engineers, specialists, in close collaboration with some associated architects. Some of the Renzo Piano Building Workshop are here tonight with us. And it's fair to say if Renzo were to have to wear all the medals he's gotten for architecture, he couldn't stand up. Um, the Royal Gold Medal for Architecture in the UK, the Kyoto Prize, no, that's 89, 90 the Kyoto Prize, 94 the Goodwill Ambassador of UNESCO for Architecture, 98 the Pritzker Architecture Prize, and 2002 the Gold Medal for the from the International Union of Architects in Berlin, 2008 Gold Medal AIA Washington DC. Um, we are so happy to have a, such a decorated and fabulous architect and a very, very good friend and close collaborator, Renzo Piano. Um, so tonight, we, we talked about this a little bit, uh, the career is way, way too big to survey in total, uh, but since we are about to open the second building, well third if you count the entry pavilion, Renzo Piano building here at LACMA, um, we thought we'd talk a little bit about museums, but about the things, the other topics that surround museums, um, because it's not architecture is a wide field it encompasses so many ideas and we've talked about those and working together it's been such a pleasure for me to have that 
occasion over these uh, four years that I've been here. My, I should say my first day on the job was April 1st, uh, 2006, and instead of going to LA, I got on a plane to go to Paris. Uh, to meet with Renzo and to hear about what he really wanted in terms of his building here. And I think it was at that meeting that we even cooked up a new idea, um, which was to imagine his master plan, which he had put forward, a, a, a grid, a space, a larger thinking for what LACMA could be. Um, and this is his drawing. This is, uh, for those of you who are architects, you can certainly recognize this. This is the Broad Building. Um, Broad Contemporary Art Museum. This would be Wilshire Boulevard right here. Entry Pavilion, the um, axial walkways. And this is the key drawing, <laughs> which um, <laughs> started the process, right? <laughs> Uh, and it, it, it's from that, this, that this idea to sort of try to complete a bit of the master plan that he had suggested with these axial relationships and to create some intimacy here began. But it's worth saying that um, Renzo, after he drew this, told me a story about his plans for this very early project, or earlier project that you probably all know, the Centre Pompidou in Paris, uh, which I loved. Uh, Renzo, when you talked about your plan for this building? Yeah. Uh, well, yes, what happened, it was a competition. It was 71, and we won that competition with Richard Rogers and myself. We are very young, bad boys uh, at that time. I'm still a uh, bad boy, but <laughs> at that time, what was really Less we young are very young. I mean, 33, 34, 35 years, so you don't really know what you do at that age. And you know, and the plan we drawn was a rectangular shape, just a just a rectangular shape, and we won the competition. And I will never forget the fact that the jury, that the the chairman of the jury was uh, um, Philip Johnson, and uh, the jury kept coming back saying, "Let's see the plan." And uh, the plan was always rectangular, four lines make a rectangular. And then this happened once, and the second time, and the third time, Philip Johnson said, okay, stop it. Okay, I understand. I don't need to know the plan. <laughs> the plan is just, it's, it's just a space to show up. And uh, that was, it, it was true. It was really a kind of a funny situation. And in fact, Bobo, uh, I keep calling Bobo, is actually, the name is the Saint Pompidou. But when we started, that was Plateau Bobo. It was a space open and empty in the middle of the Marais in Paris. The Marais is the historical mm. part of Paris. And um, it, it's made by five floors, one above the other. There are 300 meter, under feet, no, uh, more than that, uh, 900, no, 1,000 feet, 1,000 feet. By, by 200 feet wide. And, uh, and this idea that flexibility is, an in a, is a great quality in art, in culture, is something that is coming back all the time. So in reality, when we started to work on the plan for, for LACMA, well, it was at the beginning a bit more articulated than that. But then it became more and more simple. So we, we got the street, internal street, kind of urban street or pedestrian street going from LACMA East to LACMA West and even the broad pavilion on Wilshire Boulevard and another pavilion on the other side. So th it's a, and that's something that you will see. I mean, now you start to see by even complete the Resnick pavilion now, uh, or almost complete, you can start to see that uh, the idea was really, not really to make a building, but to make a place, a place for people. This, I know this was extremely controversial when it was built. You once told me a story that they, that um, they wouldn't have let you finish it, but they thought the exterior was still the scaffolding, <laughs> <laughs> which I loved. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and it's been actually restored now, and I, I've been there quite a lot recently, and it, is, it seems with age to have performed even better. Um, yeah. I think that they've learned to live with the building beautifully and use its spaces, its rooftop as a fantastic restaurant. Um, and now, it, I guess, it's become an icon of, of, of the city. But when you started out, you really did think of this, I mean, you've spoken other times about it as a, as a machine 
yeah. not a building, right? Well, it's or a, some it's way? A, it's a, it was really about, you know, I, as I said before, we are young bad boys, and we thought that the best thing to do, talking about, uh, about culture, it, this building is not really about just art, it's about culture, so it's about book, it's about library, it's about music, it's about everything. The best idea was to make something flexible and also something that was providing curiosity more than intimidation. Mm -hmm. uh, we should not forget that in, at the beginning of the 70s in Paris, museums were uh, quite dusty and quite boring places. I mean, I'm saying boring because, of course, the piece of art were fantastic, but uh, only a few people uh, used to go there. And it was not really... Normally, the intimidation was the sense of those places. So the idea, the rebellion was really to create more curiosity than intimidation. So we started to work out this idea of the factory or the refinery. And, uh, and in fact, people kept telling us that, that that building was not a cultural center. It was a factory. And we are very pleased about that, by the way. And in fact, if, if we were able to do this, building the way it was done is only because nobody understood what we were doing. <laughs> no, really, I'm not joking. Honestly, we, we, didn't know, we didn't know exactly what we were doing. But certainly nobody else understood what we were doing. <laughs> because of course they got to stop us. You know, I, I still live around there. My office in Paris right. is, uh, is there. It's one street there. And every... Every day I come, I pass by, and I keep asking, okay, we were mad and we made it, but how they can leave us to make something like that in the middle of Paris? <laughs> so, it <laughs> and, and you are right, the day of the opening, we got many kings and queens, and everybody was very surprised because 50% because of the audience thought that that was the scaffolding of the bill. And everybody st started to say, oh, when we'll be finished, we'll be very beautiful, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so I kept hiding my identity for 10 years in Paris. <laughs> and now, because it's very popular, then I can say. It's, uh, you know, it had a huge influence on me as a young person in the culture museum world because I went there so many times to study how it functioned and how people uh, used the space, and there are, of course, these signature fantastic escalators uh, on the side of the building, and as you rise up the escalators, different floors, you see over Paris. It's one of the most spectacular experiences, and in fact, uh, it's the same, I think, feeling some people have here in Los Angeles when they go up the big escalator you've made here as one single escalator, and you start to see the Hollywood he hills and the mountains reveal themselves. But there is something about that, the, the idea, it's, it, it's, it's, a, it's an experience too. I mean, you always seem to make something of transportation of the things that move you around the building. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, in fact, somebody thought that uh, this escalator here in LACMA is a kind of self-reference. Uh, maybe, but what is wrong about it? I mean, it's more really about transportation. I, I like movement in building. I think movement is a kind of fourth dimension in building. And uh, moving people in building up and down, around, is actually part. This gives a kind of a, a different dimension to the, to the building. And, and this was really a, a kind of urban machine. I mean, it's a kind of, it's in, in some ways, like landing a spy spaceship in the middle of the city. But when you get in the spaceship, you realize that it's actually like a little town because you go up and you have streets and you have escalators and you have little piazzas and then a kind of um, complex dimension. And the movement is essential in this. Yeah. I mean, you do sense that at the Broad Bill. It's funny, I was on YouTube last night looking for some pictures for this talk and I didn't have time to put them in, but there are videos people love to make going up the escalator and talking about it here. Also, uh, videos and photographs of the Chris Bird and Lamp Project. And I think like this space, you have people inspired to make performances. Um, and this is in Paris, obviously. We haven't seen anyone do this that's in Los me. Angeles. That's me <laughs> in 71. <laughs> I saw this slide in your slideshows, and I was like... <laughs> I used to do this on the piazza to, to bring life, you know. Because. <laughs> and that's how you make light. But the reason why we show this is really is, is like a joke, but it's really to say that part of the idea was really to 
It's not sacrilegious. The idea that the cultural center is also a place for people. It's a place where you mix sacred and profane. Of course, this is the profane side. <laughs> but uh, it's very, it's very, it's part of the idea. And, and again, in uh, Paris, in, uh, at the beginning of the 70s, believe me, in some way, this was a bit sacrilegious uh, to mix those uh, worlds. And uh, it was also very important, this is not showing this picture, but uh, probably in another picture we have um, a picture of the, of the space we built for Pierre Boulez. Pierre Boulez is a great composer that uh, came back to Paris in that period for music. So mixing different things, uh, art, visual art, uh, library, books, uh, music. Uh, this uh, space actually is a, is what we call espace de projection. That mean is a is a flexible space. This is a space where you can change the reverber reverberation time from 0.6 seconds to six seconds. That is a kind of machine. You know, I I I don't know for some funny reason I'm I'm attracted by machine. I like the idea of making machine. A building is a bit like machine. They are all soft machine. This is about sound. This is about reproducing, it's about studying, it's about exploring sound. And this is what Pierre Boulez and, uh, and other people, uh, including John Cage. John Cage used to come very often to, to IRCAM. IRCAM has been for 10 years at least when finished. It was a kind of center of activity for exploring sound. And, and uh, so music was also part of the, of this, uh, of the story of Bobur. But, but music, but also uh, civic life. Also the fact that the piazza became gently a, a meeting place for people. Yeah, and you obviously love music. You uh, talk about it all the time. And I know that's very much part of your sense of life, that there's art and there's music. You've spent so much time with art. Uh, you've had as much experience probably as any architect working in art museum environments. This is just a, um, this is an exhibition of Calder's work that you yeah. did in, yeah. in Turin in 82. Um, and maybe just to, for the sake, well, we have a lot of slides. Uh, this is uh, perhaps a space you're known equally as Paris for the Menil collection in Houston. And it's certainly a space I've spent a lot of time in. Um, you made it, I guess it was finished in 86. And it is, I think by many of us in the art world, considered one of the most perfect spaces for art. You designed a, a system of light that was consistent throughout from the top. The air comes from the bottom. Um, you created the, a very peaceful, calm, simple environment that integrated with this neighborhood in Houston and even created these interior spaces for plant material for... Yeah for these works. I, uh, have, I have to say, Michael, that if this space is beautiful, it's because it's the portrait of a lady that was a beautiful lady. I mean, uh, this is really, architecture is a bit the portrait of the client. And uh, this is the portrait of uh, Dominique de Menil. She was, uh, she was incredible client, very tough, very stubborn, uh, but, uh, but so good. And uh, she wanted, a functional building. In the same time, she wanted to satisfy her desire of poetry and beauty and light. Light. She was, she was especially interested by creating condition of light, natural light. And natural light is something that I, since then I've been in love all the time because natural light for showing art is magic. It's something different. It's, it's never equal. It's never flat. Natural light keeps changing. Well, in the sky of Houston, Texas, the clouds go fast, they move up and down, and Texas is like that. But everywhere in the world, you have conditions where the light goes and comes back. In the evening, you feel the day ending. Uh, and, you know, and, and this makes the space more interesting. And so the light and, uh, and uh, also bringing some magic to ra rationalism in some way. I mean, the building is functional. It's, um, that is at the end of the day what a building should be. I mean, a building to show art, it must be functional to show art. But you don't have to give up on beauty, of course, to do that, because then you are missing up the point. So 
this was really the first uh, uh, case in which we try in the office to be present with the building, but without competing with art. Actually, creating the condition in which uh, contemplation of art is perfect, but still giving character to the building. And, and this is something that I think uh, you, you can do by working on the imma immaterial part of the architecture. Uh, Rainer Barnum, that everybody probably remember, it was a great critic, used to come quite often to this uh, site. And, he c and Rainer Barnum wrote that beautiful uh, book called the, 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 uh, yeah, it, it was the, the, the architecture of the well-tempered environment. He made that book, the architecture of the well-tempered environment. Architecture made by an environment that is, is, is well-tempered. Is, and, uh, and, uh, and we talk a lot about that, uh, the idea that you create a condition architectural space by working on something that is even not touchable, is light, is a depth, is a multiple plane. By example, in this picture, you see many planes. The first plane, where you have those uh, sculptures, then you have a, a garden, then you have a second room, and then a, a second garden, and then finally, the final wall. You don't see that, uh, you don't care, by the way. Uh, but what you feel, especially when you are in the space, is the sense of depth, the sense of, of infinite that comes uh, from this uh, succession of multiple planes. So mm, this, this was really a combination of many things, but the most important thing was the climate. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, I think today in architectural debates all the time about what a museum should be and whether it should be a very extravagant building on the outside or not, I mean, ranging from the Guggenheim Museum by Frank Lloyd Wright on one side to this on the other, this has become a touchstone, I think, for that discussion of the nature of space. And she did have a very... In a great interest in a sort of spiritual quality. She's so devoted to light. She was so devoted to light that what you can't see in the picture is what's not in the picture because there are very few zoning laws in Houston. She was afraid someone would build a tall building and block the light for the museum and for the works of art. So she bought all the buildings all the way around the museum, the bungalows, the low bungalows, you p they were all painted a simple gray color and then she rented them back at low rents uh, to protect the light for the art. It was like an incredible gesture and for people like me that's so meaningful about how you consider your environment and how precious um, the environment for artwork is. Of course she has her practical side too. She was probably as penny pinching as LACMA. I remember my first meeting with her when she joined my board at DIA and I was so excited to tell her about all these plans we had and how beautiful and spiritual and fantastic this would be. And she said, you know, enough. And she had a pad and she just said, just tell me who's giving and how much. <laughs> no, she made a little list. Dominique, that was her issue. Could you get it done? <laughs> Dominique, Dominique was the most stubborn lady I never met, met in my life. <laughs> it was incredible, just incredible. But it's so light, it's so... You know, some people have uh, a light intelligence, others have heavy intelligence. She got the light intelligence. Got the she got that kind of intelligence. Uh, they're stubborn, but in the same time listening, absorbing. And this is what you need to be. To be. I mean, she was light in every sense, as a figure, in weight, as a person, and in the spirit. But, uh, but she was also very pragmatic, of course. So, and she was... She, she yeah, now, I mean, we could probably spend the whole evening talking about Dominique. This is actually, I love this picture because this is um, uh, one of That's the conservators Carol. of the Menil collection, Carol Mancusi Angaro, painting in the cons conservation lab, which looks like an artist studio, of course, with its north light. Um, and the, what's nice about the Menil collection also is that you paid as careful attention to the spaces outside the gallery as inside. So all the storage spaces upstairs are classrooms and accessible. And of course, the conservation lab has a space as beautiful as the gallery space, um, for sure. She, this, this is really this, this lady, she's a great scientist. I mean, she's an artist and she's a great scientist. And, and all this, I mean, making museum, uh, for art museum especially, is a, is, a very, is a very difficult job. It is also incredibly interesting because it's every way 
Uh, every time is different. And uh, by the way, I'm not one of those moralists that believe that museum, art museum should be uh, simple, because it's not true. I mean, if you take the, the Guggenheim, is one probably of the most beautiful museum uh, and building I ever saw in my life. And you know, it's absolutely clear that uh, the way I come to make a museum for art is, is my way, but there are many different ways. <laughs> and and, uh, and uh, if quality is there, it's fine, it doesn't matter. I mean, you, uh, in the way I come to make museum is, is, is by never forgetting that a space, a museum is for, is for ladies like this and for people in love with art and in uh, preserving art and then for people contemplating art. Uh, the, the Menil collection, but not just that one, we can talk about many, many other, is, is an example of how magic may be uh, there, but necess not necessarily with giving to fantasy too much of weight. You know, I, I love fantasy, but somebody said, I don't remember who, but somebody said, that fantasy is very good, especially, it's a bit like a marmalade, it's like jam. It's good a little by time, you know, and especially when, when you spread on a good piece of bread. Uh, <laughs> otherwise, otherwise you get lost in <laughs> fantasy. And you know, in some way, making museum is something where you have to dream, you have to, you have to do this, but in the same time you have to accept like when you make a concert hall. When you make a concert hall, you have to accept that the, the space you are building is for sound, is for music. And when you make a museum, it's for, it's for art, it's for contemplating art. And, uh, and that doesn't mean that you have to be neutral. Neutral is probably the most terrible word you can even think about, or you can invent. Neutrality doesn't exist, especially in art, the space is a stupid. Is you don't have to be neutral, but you have to accept that yeah. logic. Well, in fact, speaking of neutrality, one of the things that, I mean, for me, um, this building is so important because in the late 19th century, the big picture galleries and museums had natural light for obvious reasons, that that's where light came from, and that was the only light. And then as museums became especially conscious of things like conservation and preservation and how light actually can have damaging qualities, particularly for certain pigments and works on paper, um, the opposite happened. And through the 80s in particular, and I, I think of all the museums that were built at that time, there was a big movement to, to, that flexible meant dark. That the whole idea of a museum was you make a black box that had perfect air circulation, relative humidity, and absolutely no light because you wanted to control the light for everything. And you were very bold in this museum doing exactly the opposite at that time. And, and obviously, um, for me, that became one of the biggest non-neutral issues in museums, of the debate and discussion with curators, conservators, public direct museum directors about light. And of course, the, I think the simplest idea is light if you go to an artist studio and here you recreated Brancusi's, an environment sympathetic to these Brancusi's, uh, I, I notice in this picture the classic uh, factory north light window that, of course, artists love and um, is part of a factory. In fact, the factory I renovated in New York had exactly these same kinds of skylights for north light. Yeah, it's, a, it's a reproduction of the, of the studio, of the atelier of Brancusi that was built in Atelier Roncin in Paris. And this is where Brancusi has been living and, and dying um, in Paris. And uh, this was a new kind of reprodu uh, reproduction because it was by legal reason necessary to do that. But as Michael is saying, everything is about light. This was a little atelier. Actually, it was not that little because uh, it was bigger than the other. It was more important, so you got three modules instead of one. So <laughs> and, and, uh, and, and the magic of that was really the light. This is actually on the Piazza of Bobur now, and we have made that about 15 years ago. The, um, I think your sensitivity to space and light, it's no wonder, I mean, you know, every other museum now is designed by Renzo Piano. It seems to be that way. <laughs> and there is this, because you have this basic sensibility about light and space, this is the Beiler Foundation Museum in Switzerland, in Basel, uh, and I know he had looked at your Menil collection, and, and so many, um, I think, museums, collectors, do find that you've had a great sensitivity to light and space for art, and you do want to think about the 
art first. And this is another building where you made light a big part of the building. Yeah, this, this, this is a portrait of Ernst Bayle. The <laughs> Menil was the portrait of Dominique de Menil. This is uh, Ernst Bayle, he disappeared two months ago. He uh, was a great guy, a fantastic collectioner, and a, and a friend of artists, and he loved the, 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 he loved the idea, uh, the, the idea to work on light as well. I don't know if you have a picture inside of this building, uh, but I don't actually, not. I have one of them. But, but anyway, a, anyway, well, you probably have been, some of you have been visiting this building. It's, it's, um, it's again about that um, value that is uh, untouchable, that is atmosphere in the, muse in the museum. It's, uh, a museum is a kind of metaphysical place. It's, uh, it's above physics. It's metaphysics in that sense. It's a place where the time stops running. It's a place where the piece of art gets away from the normal dimension of time and gets in a in spatial dimension that is uh, timeless. And, uh, and in that sense, uh, I like the idea, uh, of course, wait a second. The reason why it's so interesting and so amusing to make museums is because they are all different. And this is a museum about a great collection of modern art. It's not about contemporary art or very little about contemporary art. It's mainly about so it's, it's always different because it depends from what you show and what is the content of the museum. But, but um, for the collection of Ernst Bayelet, that is one of the most beautiful collections in the world, uh, this dimension, rarefied dimension, like being uh, out of the world in a different dimension of sp uh, or in space and in time, is, it, it was poetically very important. Yeah, I mean, and again, I, I don't want to overemphasize this issue of light, but for me also, uh, it's what you talk about. I mean, the museum that you've seen that we made in New York, which is a lot about natural light, um, worked with Robert Irwin, who's a master of light also, but I know the works of art in, in that museum in New York are very good works of art, they're beautiful, but I know that the feeling people have about the museum is just as much determined by the sense of light and space and how their emotions react to that, and I think it is very critical. It's, you know, every artwork is super sensitive to its environment, and it does take that kind of effort. Just to prove it's not only light that you think of in terms of machines. I, I've actually never gotten to see this, this cult, the cultural center in New Caledonia, <laughs> but it is worth noting this is mostly about air, right? That yeah, how this, the air systems work. This is in the middle of nowhere in the Pacific is the New Caledonia, is, is east of Sydney, uh, about 1,000 miles. <coughs> is a cultural center for the for the Kanaki. The Kanaki, together with the Maori and the Aborigines, are the three et ethnic groups um, from Pacific area. And those buildings, yeah, you can you can talk about uh, being machine, but they are they are natural machine. They say that they 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 play with the the alizes. The alize blow in, from one direction, and then because of the shape of those buildings, you, you get a depression inside, and you have a natural ventilation. And each one of those 10 elements is actually devoted to one different function of cultural activity, like dance, movement, uh, theater, uh, song. And uh, well, maybe other uh, picture? Yeah, uh, we have this one oh, right yeah, this where is you see a nicer the beautiful. One. It's absolutely... And a curve, just to prove you can do it curves. It's is also <laughs> art. It's also <laughs> art. I mean, <laughs> we, we got an office there for three years, and the guy running the office refused to come back. <laughs> <laughs> No, no. I, I noticed there's an airport right by it, so you can get in wanted, and out, although it's a long... He wanted to stay there. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, <laughs> Um, if you haven't noticed, we're going in chronological order only because there was no other better way to order this. And that we're now in 1999, 2003, where you, this building you built in Dallas for the Nasher Sculpture Collection. And uh, just to say, um, also, the, the, the roof here is quite interesting. Again, natural light, 
very liberally used, and this is a metal perforated roof with tiny little perforations instead of big um, you know, glass panes and with glass under it. And you see a bit of this in the Broad building also, the idea of a glass ceiling and then a, a light filter outside. It's also a very transparent building, which is very much like the new one here. But I do notice that every time you build a building, the ceiling is different. Yeah, you never make the same ceiling twice. Because they don't work, or no, you want no, a new no, one, no. or you, you're restless? No, no, or? no, no, no. But be, because, you know, the truth is that I love making buildings. I mean, I grew up in a family of builders, and I got to, make, to be a builder myself. I, I just betrayed my father by becoming an architect, but I, I, I got, I told him, I told him, I want to become an architect, and he watched me and said, why ever? Why ever you want to be an architect? You can be a builder. <laughs> You can be God. Why you want to be an architect? Anyway, <laughs> no, but this, this idea, this idea that every building is like, is, like, is like landing in a new island, you know, it's like Robinson Crusoe, you are, you are, and, and you start again, you start from scratch, not really from scratch, you never start from scratch, but you start because every condition is different. Every building is a new adventure. And every museum is a new adventure, honestly. It's uh, so different, they're all so different. This was about a collection of sculpture, mainly. That mean that instead of the little tiny 20 foot candle lighting, here yeah, you can have a 200 or 300 foot candle. So you have a more luminous space. So, you know, things are different. And uh, the other thing that I have to confess that I love to make building piece by piece. You know, I love the idea that the building is made by pieces. And uh, I can show you every building uh, uh, we have built can be, uh, can be seen like that. And in this case, we put 300,000 li 300, little pieces on the roof because they are little tiny pieces that actually make the roof. And, and, and the idea that when you make a building, you, you push the, the edge, you push the frontier a bit further down. And, but it's not just technical. I'm not that stupid. It's not just technology. It's not just techne. It's also, it's also desire. It's about architecture is the art of, of uh, satisfying need, the practical needs. But it's also the art of satisfying desires, dreams. And, and this is where architecture becomes interesting. Otherwise, it's, it's, not, it's, not, it's not interesting. So in reality, you combine every time, especially in a museum that is by itself, it's like a dream. It, it, you combine those two things. You combine the art of making good, well-crafted building because you need to make good, well-crafted buildings because museums are forever. Uh, uh, when you make a museum, it's never for 10 or 20 years, is for 2,000 years. It's for a long time. Museum must be able to defy time because museum build quality. Museum make quality in, for many reasons and they preserve quality forever, for a long time. So you have to be extremely good when you make a museum. Well, you have to be very good even when you make a house, but for a museum, of course, you have to be extremely good because it's forever. No, I'm not joking. Uh, sometimes I look at the, at the builder and say, how long you give the current? They say, normally 10 years. No, we need 1,000. <laughs> and, and they normally get very nervous. <clears throat> but that's what you have to do. But at the same time, it has to be an experiment, right? <laughs> not an experiment, but by example, they normally don't leak. My first building, they all leaked. Yeah. But now they don't leak anymore. As much. But now they don't look anymore. <laughs> when so we were having trouble with our elevator at the beginning in the Broad I, building. What I'm just trying to say that. I'll tell that story in one second. What, what, what you no, I was saying, when we were having trouble with the elevator in the Broad building, <laughs> and I was Melody Kenshat, who's our president, who oversees all the constructions, worked with you carefully. And I was saying, well, isn't that the architect's fault? And she said, well, Renzo has a clause in his contract which says everything's an experiment, and if it doesn't work, don't blame me. <laughs> it's on. very cl only you I could get away with that. <laughs> no, she she didn't say that. I'm sure. <laughs> anyway, anyway, 
No, I, I'm just trying to, to, to say something that is absolutely true. Making building is, is a great experience. It's fantastic because it's never just one dimension. Making architecture, making building is, by, is very pragmatic. It's by making well-built things. It's making shelter for human beings. Making place for people is the other thing. It's never just making building. It's also making place for people. It's also social. It's a, it's a humanistic activity. It's about human beings. It's about society. It's about a better society. It's about utopian idea that you can change the world by making a better one, possibly. So it's never just technical. It's never just making shelter. It's also about making place for people to gather, to stay together. And to make things a bit more complicated, it's also about beauty. It's about also about poetry. It's about, it's about that untouchable things that is beauty. It's impossible to reach, you know. Our arms are too short. When you're almost there, you're just missing a little inch to get beauty. So, but it's always that kind of struggle. So making architecture is always a funny mix of pragmatism, making the piece well done, well built, that comes together. It's about creating place for people to enjoy, to stay together, to enjoy the same joy, contemplating art, listening to the same concert, or staying together, reading book, or whatever. But it's also about magic, it's also about beauty, it's about poetry, it's about creating place where fe people feel well. It's, a bit, it's something un untouchable. Um, you all you get almost there, but never there. You know, it's it's kind of kind of a struggling sense of uh, lack of uh, um, incapacity. I don't know in English in Italiano which incap incapacita. Okay, that's what that's what people love about these buildings. I think uh, proof you can do curves. More proof. This is the Zentrum Paul Clay in, in uh, Switzerland. Um, actually, in the sa for the sake of time, why don't I just, I wanna, that's the, uh, uh, another perf uh, music space, sound space, which is there at the Zentrum Paul Clay, which is quite amazing in its engineering. Is that you playing the, no, not you playing the piano. <laughs> he says he's playing, the, he's gonna play the but piano you know, for our new bar. I'm pleased you showed, because this is Michael, it's not me. I mean, he, he decided what to show. But anyway, I'm pleased to show, to you show something about music, because music and, 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 and art, uh, visual art, for me, c come together, they cross. And in this specific case of Paul Klee, this is a museum we built in, in Bern for Paul Klee. And Paul Klee was a very, he's a great artist, and, and very confused guy, because he, he never understood in his life if he was more a painter or a musician. I'm not joking. He wrote about that. He was, of course, a great painter, but he was also a musician. And in some way, the dimension, musical dimension, was very important. And, and Pierre Boulez, uh, I'm very familiar with, uh, made a beautiful book, uh, Au Pays Fertile. In the, in, the, in the fertile country, that is the title of one of the beautiful paintings of Paul Klee. And in that, in that book, Pierre Boulez explored the interconnection, not easy to find, between music and, and, uh, and visual art. And it's, it's it, the, 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 those two dimensions, uh, creative dimension, music and visual art, they, 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 they cross each other. They never get confused because, of course, uh, art, visual art is visual art. A painter is a painter, a sculptor is a sculptor, a, a writer is a writer, and a musician is a musician, and an architect is an architect. So you have a you have language, and it's not true that you can actually move things from one to the other, but it's always about the same need of clarity, of precision, the same need of rules, in the same time, the same desire to break the rules, you know. And, and this is what music is about. Music is about mathematics, it's about geometry, it's about precision. At the same time, it's about breaking, it's about blowing everything up again. And, you know, it's always this. So if you get that point and you don't get confused about language, 
because then it becomes stupid and very silly. But if you get to that point, you realize that all those adventures, being a musician or being a, a painter or being a sculptor or being even a little poor architect, is always about that. It's about that struggle between order and disorder, about precision and, and surprise. And the sound is something incredible. Sound designs space, but it's not true that by just making sound and you design space, you, you have to be there. But this space was, was is actually, is actually used very well in Bern for, for concert. Renzo loves music so much when we, he told us today when we open the cafe, new cafe and bar that he's designing that he will play the piano for us, right? No, no I used to, trumpet. to play trumpet, <laughs> but so badly, badly that nobody wanted me. And that's why I became an architect. <laughs> but I wanted to be. I want to ask you a question. This is the um, renovation and expansion of the Morgan Library in New York, which was finished in 2006. Um, and it also, you see some of the key features of light and space that you see in some of your other projects. But this was a particularly interesting and complicated work because you were dealing with an existing building that was quite well known and quite formidable. Um, and I also know now you've just taken on the immense responsibility to add on to the Kimball Museum in Fort Worth, which I think many of us believe is, if there's a temple uh, in, 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 in this country right now, that is certainly w one of the very most special buildings. So I, I'm interested in how you approach that problem. The other projects we've seen have been ones <coughs> you've started well, from scratch. Well, it's, it's, it's not easy to talk about so different things, but you know, I'm Italian, and there is very little I can do about that. And, <laughs> and, uh, and in Italy, you grow up with this sensation that cities are made by stratification of things, things happening one after the other, you know, and, and, and you have that sense of something done without necessarily destroying or aggressing what was there before. Actually, that's what, that, that is what makes cities beautiful in Italy or everywhere in the world, is that sense of stratification is where you recognize the city are mirror of millions of real lives and, and, uh, and that get petrified, get materialized in the city. So this is what is great. So you grow up, in, in I, I grew up in Genoa, that is a city where stratification is absolutely, uh, absolutely evident. And, and you grow up with this idea that when you have some, to do something like Morgan, you don't have to destroy everything around. You just take your knife and you just make precise cut, like a surgery, like precise surgery, and then you start to play. And, uh, and uh, if you have a stone, then you play with something else, like a crystal, because then you make clear, like uh, what you do when in normally in the restoration, you make clear what you have done and what somebody had, else has done before. And this is true for every kind of restoration, including music. I have a good friend that and that was Luciano Berio that made a beautiful restoration of a piece of Brahms, by example, by adding pieces. And he, they, he had pieces that were almost visible. Well, usable, not visible, but in some way is always possible. So it's also possible in architecture. You play with, by doing something that is clearly added and is not aggressive. This is true for Morgan. In the case of Kimball, it's different because uh, I think that the Kimball from Cannes is, for me, is the best uh, piece of architecture from Cannes. And it's a, it's a beautiful building. It's fantastic in size and scale. So we are making addition. We are ready to start on site now. But it's not touching the building. It's actually across the, the lawn. It's a distance of about 100 feet. And we are working, echoing the scale of the building, the size, the scale is actually quite small addition, the height and the rhythm. And uh, so uh, when you uh, make an addition uh, to something that is there, that is historical or very important, you have to be careful because you don't have to, to, mm, to lose your own uh, capacity to be creative. I mean, you cannot give up, I mean, you, you have to be yourself. In the same time, you have to find the, the, 
the, the logic. In, in the case of Kimball, well, it's difficult to talk now without image, but <coughs> it's about making a new building that is, uh, is on the other side of the lawn, and, and the two buildings talk each other in some way. And, and that's, uh, the, that's the idea. Um, this project is closer to home. Uh, this is the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, which opened two years ago. And it really introduced, with its fantastic green roof, um, in your work, a big interest in, in green architecture and the environment and thinking about it. Not that you weren't always thinking about the environment, but now it becomes a technical problem, perhaps, also, as well as a philosophical one. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> well the, the earth is fragile, and this is clear since a long time, but now become more and more evident. This building is the first uh, uh, platinum building in the LEED system. In, in this country, I mean a big building and public building. Um, this is like a machine. It's a, it, I should say it's a biological machine. I mean, you saw that little basket before. Um, can you show again? We put 50,000 of those baskets, and in, and in, the, in the building we have um, about one million little plants, and those plants are native, uh, native plants from California. They don't need the watering. They can grow with uh, the natural humidity of San Francisco in the night. <coughs> and uh, and uh, the entire idea in this building uh, is that uh, the, the language of, uh, of uh, green architecture is not necessarily boring. I mean, there's a kind of ongoing idea that when architecture like uh, food, like organic food, when is, when is good, when is organic is not good. I mean, when <laughs> architecture is, 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 is a green is, is actually boring. It's not true. I mean, the, I, I think, by the way, that today for young architects, um, it should be really a field where um, exploring you know, every country, every century, sorry, a got a, a, something really worth of inspiration. The 19th century got new technology. Still, the 20th century, <coughs> all the things, global culture. The 21st century has this simple thing that Earth is more fragile than everybody thought. And, and in some way, there is language there in architecture that is expressing. Buildings should breathe. They should breathe at the rhythm of the earth in some way. I don't want to be romantic, but in some way, this building is an attempt to show that you can actually uh, uh, make a build, big building without air conditioning. This building has no air conditioning, by example. But this is possible in San Francisco. It's impossible in Los Angeles, of course, because you know that. San Francisco has a special climatic condition, but it's possible. And, and so, but in doing this, you have to play with the funny things, like, for example, the, all those little cell, solar cells that are on the edge. And those are solar cells, by example, on the edge of the building, of, of the roof, create on the ground <coughs> a kind of shadow that is the same shadow you have under a leaf of the trees. Of, of a tree, so it's a kind of natural, it's very interesting, it's a, it's a vibrant, a vibration are part of this. And uh, so, I don't want to make too much, but in some way, this building is, is also a machine, is a biological machine. Uh, which you really see when you see the building and know how it functions. And it is, an, congratulations on the Platinum Leeds <coughs> certification, it's a it really incredible achievement. Um, so in the interest of time and wanting to get to questions, I'm going to skip through Chicago, our competition, since it was also so well reviewed, <laughs> so beautiful and elegant. Um, and I want to just, uh, this is the new museum, the Modern Wing in the, at the Art Institute of Chicago, and quite extraordinary. And I want to just end by talking a little bit about what you did here in Los Angeles. Uh, this is the Broad Contemporary Art Museum. Uh, obviously, and uh, 
It's a nice, I like this view because it actually comes from your photographs. You see not only the skylight system of the Broad building, you see the fire escape. So all the functional devices have become the ornamentation. Um, and then these two artworks, uh, this one by Chris Burden, Urban Light, and these palm trees by, uh, that Robert Irwin helped us design. And we talked a lot, it, it was a chance for you to work um, as part of the project, we changed the design of the entry pavilion to accommodate these artworks and make a more flow through space, I think in part to create some of what you talked about in terms of a sense of place. Um, and a sense of place that had an identification uh, with Los Angeles. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, maybe we have all the picture, but um, I think that the LACMA for me was, is, an adventure a bit different because it's really about building, but it's also about creating a place. Uh, the system made up by by the Broad Pavilion, uh, the Broad uh, Museum, and then the new one, and then Lakman West one day on the left of the picture, and Lakman East, and the entrance, uh, the Chris Burden, and all this, uh, the new piazza that you will enjoy in a few months now. Uh, it, it, all this is really about the creating place for people. It's also about, again, about making building that house uh, the, uh, the portrait of somebody, you know. The, <coughs> the, the broad building is, is a portrait of a light broad in some way. And a light broad is also a very stubborn guy, <laughs> that's for sure. Uh, and, and, you know, in some way, this is part of the adventure of an architect. You know, you are working with somebody and, uh, and you know, you are working in, in ping pong, in playing ping pong, and you, and you, need, you need that. And, and the new building that you will uh, see uh, soon, I hope, the new pavilion, the resident pavilion, is also a portrait of another vision that is complementary to the one of, of the broad building. But they all come together, I hope, I cross my finger, but they all come together to create a new place. And I think this will happen. And, and also, you know, in some way, what is difficult about architecture, that architecture live uh, on long times. Uh, architecture uh, gets realized on, it's not like, uh, like fashion that is immediately understandable. Architecture needs the time. In, in it, it rely on long times, like a forest, like rivers, like mountains, it, like cities in reality, because this is what is architecture is, the art of making cities, place for people, that is uh, the art of making cities. So mm, in some way, <coughs> well, this picture is showing, of course, the third floor of a broad pavilion, a broad building, <coughs> that is about natural light. And and you will see very soon, <coughs> sorry. Sorry, this is the airplane. I just came from Paris. Uh, <coughs> this is about natural light. But um, the most important thing about LACMA for me is the combination of all those elements. They come together and they shape the space. And working with uh, other people like uh, and Bob Irwin, by example. Bob Irwin has been working with uh, Palm. <coughs> I never saw somebody like a little boy is so in love with the trees. Bob Irwin is in love with trees and is working now since, what, two years? Something like that? Three, almost three, three years. years. Three years. Well, and and you will more. see, you will see. Soon you will be able to see. This is still going, but it, and everything comes together. So for me, LACMA is more than a building, it's a, it's a combination of building that make a place for people. Yeah. The, you know, it's, it's, we've now had the Broad Building open for two years. It's true that from architect some architecture critics' point of view, not everything you do is perfect, although mostly perfect. But there was a big discussion about this building and whether it was too plain and too simple. And I have to say, after programming and being in the building for two years, the feedback from, particularly from artists and from curators, has been so fantastic because of its simplicity and flexibility. And it seems like what you did at 
in Los Angeles does have a little to do with going back to that idea of the Santri Pompidou and something that is so flexible that is a machine that wears its function on its outside. Um, here's a drawing. Just, this was the first drawing for the uh, Resnick Pavilion, yeah. which you see is asymmetric. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, on the bro, on the bro building, I wanted to be to make it something a bit more complicated, but in the discussion with uh, Eli Bro, that was a great client, of course, he wanted to take away everything that was not essential to show us. And there's so much that the only extra piece there are the toilets. <laughs> and I told him, you know, it because he kept telling me, take away, take away. I said, look, the only thing left is the, are the toilets, so I cannot <laughs> take and, and the stairs. But, you know, in some way, this is, w this is the reason why that building is what it is. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a, it's a warehouse for us. And then and, and, and the new building, the new pavilion, the Resnick Pavilion, is different. You, well, you will see and you will judge, but it's really another machine in, in the way I, 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 I love to make machine. It's actually very simple. Is a space about 40,000 square feet with the four red machine on each corner that are actually feeding the building and making the building breathe. Patrons, <laughs> Stuart and Linda Resnick. And here's the, you see the machine going up. This building was really amazing to watch going up because it was an erector set. And I have to say, I think the design did take off. I mean, w uh, for me, the, the, the Broad building was inspirational in its absolute distilled simplicity. Um, nothing extra. And there's almost nothing extra in this building. It is simply floor, air, and light. Um, it was fantastic to watch it. And then the, the, in this case, it's the mechanical systems that you worked so hard on uh, so that this, the first building, I think, in a long time since Santra Pompidou, which really expresses uh, the, the, uh, the function so clearly. A lot of debate. You had um, y yourself about whether you wanted to paint these red and wanted to become so sculptural. They do look a little like the ship parts from your previous Sometime days. Sometimes when I look to those things, I think that... Uh, the it's about deformity. I don't know if deformity is the same word in Italian. In Italian, deformità is not necessarily wrong. I mean, deformity is something different in form, different <laughs> shape. And, and uh, those buildings are kind of uh, uh, drawn by the pure sense of necessity. And that is quite interesting. It's actually, it's not true, of course, what I'm saying, because I just said before that it's not true. But in <laughs> But I love that idea, that you make a building because, because it works that way. You know, I, I like that idea as a builder, again, uh, because I, 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 I owe this to my father. You know, the art of making things like that, you put together pieces and they clock, they, they plug and they work. And uh, sometimes give something uh, that people may feel is a deformity, but these are the solar panels on the entry pavilion, and again, you see the machinery and the new roof. Um, and you see how the two buildings start to really work together in terms of the red, the filigree that is all of its function on its out outside. And these are Bob Irwin's uh, palm trees as they're trying, starting to emerge. There's a very difficult problem because of the garage being right under the building. There's very little earth to put anything on, so he had to invent ways to yeah. put trees on uh, parking garage. The, the good thing about working with Bob Irving is that I make order and he makes this order. You know. <laughs> <laughs> You're pretty good with color. I love these uh, blue green. Exactly. As it should be. So you'll all see this very soon. Um, we open in September. This is a, actually a piece of architecture Bob Irwin just made with 16 simple uh, date palms that are very nicely cut, and this balances the um, <coughs> ceremonial walkway north-south with the Chris Burden lamps at the other side. That's so very ordered. That's very ordered. You have a nice, beautiful entry. And the collaboration has been so much fun to watch um, between the two of you, and I think they've resulted in something very special um, that you'll 
all the public will see. Here's music on the plaza. As you can see, we've activated it in that sense. And a uh, sneak peek at what the building looks like inside. It's an acre under skylights. <laughs> Completely flexible, perfect light um, with uh, systems in the skylights so that we can have open light at 40-foot candles for paintings. We can bring the shades, hidden shades down to create 10-foot candles for more fragile works. And the building, the specification was that it could be open day or night with no spotlights. So there's perfectly even natural light during the day, and then there are hidden uh, up lights to bounce light off the, um, the backs of the skylights. As the sun goes down, they gently go up, and so it is quite a simple uh, functional oh, and flexible space. Of course, space. you realize that the truth is that since uh, Michael made the Dia Beacon, he never rec recovered. And, uh, and <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, he wanted to make, to make something on um, that logic, but, you know, made in, in, in such a way that is perfect from the point of view of humidity, temperature, controlling light and all that, security and all that. But in some way, the, the spirit is really to make, to make something that is, is, a, is a tool. Is a tool, and this is exactly what you wanted, Michael, to make a tool in the LACMA that made possible the dream of of making LACMA always a place of surprise, a place where you can bring new things happening beside the great collection of art. So this is really a tool, and it got to be a tool, uh, and and I think that well, we will see, we will see soon. Well, I have to say, uh, oh, this is this the funny, speaking of bathrooms, since Renzo was telling that story, um, we decided in this building, just for fun, his idea was to make bathrooms with 22-foot high ceilings and skylights. <laughs> just as a beautiful compliment. And the two buildings, I just to end, I just want to say, Renzo, how proud we are in Los Angeles that you, uh, at Eli Broad's suggestion, came to Los Angeles to work on these two beautiful buildings that will be with us now we know for a thousand years because they've been built so well, and we're very proud to have your work here in LA for our artworks. Thank you. And um, maybe if there are a few questions. Several years ago in Israel, I found myself in a museum, very early in Israel, a museum in one of the kibbutz, with the great daylight. And I was told that on suggestion of the uh, first director of the Pontus Center, Pontus Halton, you and um, your client in Houston flew to see this museum. Is it true? Absolutely true. Can it you tell us about that? It was on the lake of Tib Tiberia, the lake. And I remember, and I told you, she was a very stubborn lady. So she told me, Renzo, we have to go to Israel to see a magnificent example of what we should do. I said, never. Forget it, we will never find. She said, no, we have to go. And we went there. Pontus Sultan. Pontus Sultan, Sultan was the, 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 at that time, was the director of the curator for the Saint Pompidou. So he was the one that said, you have to go there. So we went up there to that little kibbutz, and we found that the space. It was a square room with the four sides. Of course, one was looking north. And that was the only one that worked. The other one didn't work, of course, because the light was coming from everywhere. And the only light that you have to bring inside the museum is the one from north, because it's more stable. So we said, OK, fine, <laughs> great. And so we, we pick up that part that was working, and we came back. But those, uh, those uh, journey are very important, because not, you never find what you really are looking for. But what, what you do is that you build up a complicity with the client, and you, you build up the same desire. And as I said before, desire are the moving, moving power of, of, of people, desire. And, and, and uh, so I remember that day, and we went back to, 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 to Jerusalem. The mayor was Teddy Collette, a great man. And we talk all the evening about that adventure. And then, then, of course, she said, see, it was very useful. Of course it was very useful. And, <laughs> and it was just, just a structure. It was not a curve like we did in Manila. 
collection. Uh, but this idea that, you know, the light, when we talk about light, people maybe not, don't understand one very important thing, that light for a museum must come from above, because if it comes on the side, that is sometimes very interesting, because you see out, but then you get blinded. And, and very disturbed. And also the light coming from the side is very strong, uh, 10 feet from the window, and then become immediately too low. And when it's too strong, it's too strong. When it's too low, it's too low. So the good light come from above and come from north. Because on north, between a gray day and a sunny day, blue sky, the difference is about half. But when you look south, between the sunny day and the, and the great day, the difference is uh, 50 times bigger, so you cannot manage that. And so you have to cut too much of intensity, and then you don't know how to. So that's the reason why many of those museums, especially this one in Los Angeles, because Wishar Boulevard is exactly running east-west. So the axe is exactly east-west, north-south, and so uh, the building is more easy to be done because then you can protect the sky, the, the roof from south, and you take the light from the north. So in some way, from that little kibbutz, the experience is coming here now. I think I wanted to ask you this question for a number of years. I thought there's a story. It's too, be, too good to be true, but now. <laughs> I was just curious, uh, I, I'm sure you've at least heard of the plans for the train sculpture that uh, uh, Michael and uh, Jeff Koons have uh, been working on, and I was just curious if you had uh, any sense of um, uh, how it might play out with what you've, what you've done in the building. And uh, I'm not sure, I'm, I'm pretty ambivalent about it, so I was curious if you are too. <laughs> <laughs> I do answer or you want? <laughs> My, I, I, love, I love that project, I love that project. I think it's totally mad, of course, <laughs> uh, but, but I, I love it. I, it's, it's mad for many, many reasons to start with, and this is something I said, Jeff Kuntz, because of course it's very difficult because Los Angeles is a, is a, is a, is a seismic area, and uh, it's not easy to hang something that heavy <laughs> in the seismic area. <laughs> Uh, so, um, uh, but this is just the, the technical part. I, I, I like, I like the, I like the idea of uh, that piece hanging there. Uh, now the question is more where this should happen because it, it, we have been moving this idea a number of times, and this is something Michael can answer more easily than me. And I, I hope th it will happen. Because again, for me, the combination of Chris Burden and John Baldassari and then, uh, and then uh, Michael Heiser there, possibly, I hope, and Jeff Kuhn there, and all those pieces, it's like, a, like, a, it's like a village, but I don't use the word village in romantic terms. It's, I, I use the word village in the sense of a place of surprise. It's a place where every corner, every, every, Every time you turn your head, is something interesting, something new. Everything swimming in the trees of Bob Irwin. I like that idea. I like that complex, organic idea. And in this uh, logic, that is, uh, of course, uh, a bit mad, uh, the, uh, a piece of art like that one would be fantastic, I think. That's my opinion. Um, it's not easy to be built, but you can say something more than me. Do you have some observations about Franco Albini's museums in Genoa? Well, uh, Franco Albini, that maybe uh, very few know, I'm happy you, t you know his work, was my master. Uh, when I was a student in Milan in, uh, at, the, at the end of, uh, at the beginning of the 60s, 60, 61, 62, um, I was going there to work in the day, and uh, I was occupying the faculty of architecture in the night. That was my double life. 
because in Milan we were much faster than in Paris and the 68 uh, happened in 62 in Milan. So we, uh, we started to occupy the Faculty of Architecture in 62, that was the first time. And uh, so I got a double life for two or three years, I made double life. In the night I was uh, making political activity, in uh, political in the, in the good sense of the word. Uh, and uh, there, so I was occupying the faculty, mm, falling asleep three o'clock uh, after long discussion. And then in the morning I was going to Franco Albini. And Franco Albini was, for me, a great master. He was a craftsman. He was somebody that taught me how to make building by piece by piece. Frank Albini made building and actually object piece by piece. And he, he was a great master. He was, it's, it's not well known, not enough, but he made beautiful things in general. And that's the also, uh, I was working in the office in Milan, but every Saturday we were going together, I was driving down to Genoa to Palazzo Rosso, Palazzo Bianco, that you may know, and the beautiful. And, um, and he was a master of lightness as well. You may have noticed that, that he made many, many stairs. He was a master in making stairs, but the stairs never touched ground. Or never. They were always coming that close to the ground, but never touching. And the result was the stair was moving like that all the time. <laughs> but apart from that little detail, <laughs> they were beautiful, <laughs> beautiful, fantastic. And I, I, I got in my house, when I got my first time, I got a famous uh, bookshelf that was collapsing all the time uh, because it was made of tension, but it, this was not a kind of a mass production. It was an, 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 ex, an, 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 an experiment and made in the office. Uh, the, and that was probably the, the, the cause of my divorce because <laughs> I, got, I got to remount that, that bookshelf <laughs> that I defended with my body. <laughs> But Franco Bini was one of those men, Italian <coughs> architect of that generation that was uh, fantastic and with a great uh, dedication to the art of making things, the poetry of making things. That is there, is there. It's not something, it's something that people tend to forget, but there is a beauty, there is a poetry in making things, in the art of making things. So thank you for talking about Franco Bini. Uh, so I'd just like to say thank you, Renzo Piano. <laughs> and uh, thanks to the AIA Los Angeles and to all of you for being here. And uh, you will very soon get to see more of the fruits of Renzo's labors here in Los Angeles. Thank you. <laughs>